Genesis 26. If you're not there already, go ahead and get there. Appreciate you all coming. Appreciate you folks online. Uh, I want you to continue to pray um, for some people. Um, this job that God calls you to be in, there's a lot of good rewards with it, and money doesn't have anything to do with that. Um, it's a joy to study the Word. It's a joy to learn this book. And the years that I live on this earth, I want God to always continue to show me something. I don't ever want to say I know it all or stop learning. But then there are things that get laid on you that you don't choose. And it's part of the job. And I've had situations like that before. But, uh, I mean, I can't, I can't say more than what I'm saying today. Uh, but somebody in our church has been wounded very bad. And um, God laid it on their heart to reach out to me yesterday. And... Um, you just pray. God knows who it is. God knows who's affected by it. God knows everything there is to know about it. And you trust God. You trust God. And um, it is unfortunately a sign of these times that we live in. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind. So just, just pray for some families and what they're going through right now and just say, God, I don't know who it is, but I love them. They're your people. God, would you help them? And you always think this way. If it was you, would you not want people praying for you? Even if they didn't know what they were praying for, God knows how to deal with it. God can take care of it. And what are the greatest, I think this is probably underrated, even though I preach on it all the time, the three things that we do as Christians, pray, read our Bible, join in the fellowship of God's people, because we need each other. And the days are drawing closer and closer where we are going to absolutely need those things in our life if we're going to make it. Uh, and I believe God will lead each one of us in his way to that to that day he promised he would never leave us nor forsake us and I trust in that you know what keep keep your Bible there in Genesis 26 I'm gonna to go touch on that <clears throat> what I was saying a while ago about that song um, I shall know him I shall know him and redeemed by his side I shall stand I shall know him, I shall know him, by the print of the nails in his hand. There is only one Jesus. There's only one. The true one, the just one, the holy one. Uh, but let me, let me just draw your attention. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 6. These, again, these are things you know. Or should know. Um, but I'm going to bring them out tonight again. Uh, verse 14. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. And this is part of what I would have preached this morning. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And that applies in fellowship. Friendship. Marriage, business partnership. If you're a born-again Christian, would you want to go into business with somebody who is not a born-again, Bible-believing, practicing, living Christian? 
you wouldn't want to do it because I guarantee you the devil is going to use that person to either compromise you or sway you over. And you'll have to take a stand and it'll probably cost you a fortune. But in everything in life, God calls us out to be separate. And he said, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Now, if you know the Bible and you don't know the difference between what is right and what is wrong, there's something wrong with you. If you don't know the difference between sin and goodness, there's something wrong with you. And what communion hath light with darkness? And they don't mix. It's either light or it's dark. It's not a combination of the two. What concord hath Christ with Belial? Belial is Satan. All through the Bible you find children of Belial, sons of Belial, daughters of Belial. Children of Satan, basically is what they... And, and that is all who are lost and remain lost. They are children of Belial. And think of this. Satan tried to get Jesus into a concord with him. He tried three times to tempt him. And on one occasion, he said, if you will bow before me, I will give you all these kingdoms because they're mine. They're mine to do with. And he was right. And Jesus said, mm -mm. so it's been tried, but Christ does not make an agreement with Belial. What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? The word fidelity means faith. And if you practice fidelity in life, in your marriage, in your relationships, then you are a faithful person. If you are unfaithful in life, in friendships, partnerships, marriage, church, business, whatever it is, if you are an infidel and unfaithful, you, that's what you are. You're an infidel. You don't trust God. You don't trust his word. Uh, and what agreement hath the temple of God, which is this body, with idols? And I didn't get a chance to go into that today during Sunday school, but Ezekiel 14, man, you've got to read that. If you want to understand idol worship in its truest form, go read Ezekiel 14. Because God nails those guys from Israel. And he says, Ezekiel, you don't know this, but they've got idols in their heart. I can see them. That's because Jesus is the word of God and he knows everything about us. And he said, what part hath he that believe, what, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Now you might ask, what is that unclean thing? Well, it's a lot of things. We could, I could probably go for an hour and just point out unclean things. But I believe specifically that there is something that is going to appear or show up in this world and we, God's people, are going to say that's unclean and I'll have no part of it. What, look at what he says. Um, Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. What was it that Samson, as a Nazarite under a Nazarite vow, what was he not allowed to touch? Who knows? Give you a free DVD if you answer it. What is a person, this, this would apply to Samson, apply to John the Baptist, uh, Samuel, I believe, was under a Nazarite vow. These are lifetime. Men who were under the Nazarite vow for their life. What was the one thing that they were not allowed to touch? We know they couldn't eat grapes or drink wine or any raisins or anything like that. Anything that's dead. Anything that's dead. And 
the Bible reveals to us in Revelation 17 that the beast was and is not, but shall be. It, then it says, he was, is not, yet he is. And that, I think that means he's dead. And they're going to bring him back to life, but he's dead. And there's something about it. I think we're going to see, God's going to tell us, don't touch that. Don't have any part with that. And he said, I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Turn to uh, 2 Corinthians 11. <clears throat> Verse 1. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. And I'm going to bring some of that out tonight. As a pastor, as a pastor, I can get jealous. Okay? It's, it's, to be honest with you, I think it's part of the job. And it has to do with protecting the flock from things that I know or believe. Are harmful so if I warn you about somebody that I know to be a false prophet and it's somebody that you like somebody whose messages you hear hear me out on it because if I'm gonna call somebody out to be a false prophet it's because I've looked at their doctrine I've examined it and from scripture, I can tell you they're a liar. Things you might not notice. But I have a godly jealousy. Is not God a jealous God? He says that. You shall have no other gods before me. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. And I'll visit the iniquity of the fathers under the third and fourth generations. What he said. So Paul is saying that to this church. He started this church. Why wouldn't he be jealous and zealous? For them. And he says, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I've espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's why he's jealous. He knows that if that church turns left when they should have turned right, they're going to end up being a whore. And he says, I'm not presenting a whore. To Jesus Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And the bottom line is, the devil convinced Eve of words that he said God knew them, but God wouldn't tell Adam or Eve what they were. He presented to Eve a false version of God's word. A fake gospel. He did it. And she fell for it. And that's what he's saying here. I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. And yes, sir, yes, ma'am. I, as a pastor, I can get jealous. Now, if you're just changing churches, and their doctrine's good, and what they believe, and I'm fine with that. God bless you. But if I, if I know you're headed into a disaster, what kind of man would I be if I didn't try to warn you? What kind of husband would I be if I knew that some guy was trying after my wife and I just let it go? What kind of husband would I be? So he warns us here of another Jesus. Um... Galatians. Look in Galatians. 
Uh, chapter 3, verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only what I learn of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And therein lies the difference between the true gospel and every other false gospel. It, it always has a work of the flesh that you must perform in order to atone for your own sins. And that is a lie. I don't care what religion it is. I don't care what they call it. It's a lie. The Catholic Church is supreme amongst those who say they follow Jesus in that false gospel. They are supreme in it. They've got the market cornered on a fake gospel and a fake Jesus. Because in Catholicism, who is Jesus to them? Who's Jesus to a Catholic? The Pope. The Pope is referred to as the Vicar of Christ. V-I-C-A-R is the word. Look that up. It means someone who stands in the place of Christ. And he says, I am Christ. I am the vicar of Jesus Christ. And he has fooled billions of people since the first Catholic Church ever came about that the Pope was God. Okay? Now, how about... Well, I'm going to roll here. I'm going to keep going. Second Thessalonians. I mentioned that. Turn there. And then we'll get to Genesis 26. We'll try to tie it together. We'll see if it works. That, 2 Thessalonians 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Notice he says, nor by letter as from us, like any of the other apostles. There was discovered... In 1947, a group of manuscripts called the Nag Hammadi texts. It's, Nag Hammadi is an area in Egypt, and that's where they found them. And they were full of so-called gospels. One of them was the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. That Mary Magdalene wrote a gospel account of Jesus Christ. And in that one... She and Jesus are carrying on. And Peter's jealous of it. That's sick. They discovered one called the Gospel of Judas Iscariot. Which it says basically that Jesus and Judas got together and were going to play good cop, bad cop. Jesus says, Judas, go along with me on this. I'll tell you secrets and I'm not telling the other apostles. If you'll be the bad guy... I'll play the martyr, and we'll, we'll carry this thing forward, okay? That's what the gospel of Judas says. Now, it doesn't take a genius to figure out, that ain't the gospel. And yet, some people believe it. So he said, that's why he says, nor by the letter, as from us. If you don't believe that we have the complete record of God by now, then you're going to fall for something that they're going to present to you. Um, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Now, here's what a false gospel on this sounds like. Okay? In this verse, he said, that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Now, what does that say to you? A falling away. What, what do you think that's talking about? Going back to the old life, walking away from Jesus, the gospel, turning your back on your Bible, everything, right? Well, according to Jimmy Swaggart, you're wrong. Somebody sent me the Jimmy Swaggart Bible. It is a King James Version Bible. And Jimmy Swaggart and Donnie Swaggart, his son, and another guy, I don't know who he is, they put a Bible together, a King James Bible, where they added their beliefs right into the text. They didn't put it down on the bottom or like in the margin. 
They put it in parentheses, or uh, what are those lines? Not parentheses, right? It's parentheses, right? They put in parentheses what they believed that verse was telling. And in this verse, in this verse, at this statement, there should come a falling away first. They say that the Greek word here, apostasia, which is where we get the word apostasy, in this case, doesn't mean falling away. It means going up the rapture. That's not what it says. But they inserted that right in the text, in parentheses. All of that to support a doctrine that, in my opinion, doesn't fit. The idea that nothing's going to happen until we're raptured and then it'll all fall apart. Well, this verse plainly tells you something different. So we have to change what this verse says. And they do it. And they do it right in the text. Now, you don't have to ask me, have I sent him any donations lately? And then he said... There shall come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God. God, 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 God. Four times in that one verse. But he's not God. He's not Christ. He's not our Savior. So, my question to everybody that's listening to me, Tonight, and whoever listens to this beyond tonight, are you sure you're going to know him when you see him? Are you sure? I would get that one worked out before I did anything else in my life. Do, are you sure you're going to know him? Genesis 26. <clears throat> we just happened to sing that song, and I just... Felt like we needed to preach it. <clears throat> Genesis 26. Um, this is now, we've transitioned from Abraham and Sarah. Now we're looking at the next generation. Isaac and Rebekah and their life. And we see some familiar things that we've already seen with Abraham. Remember, Abraham, there was a famine in Abraham's lifetime, and he had to leave and go someplace else. And while he was there, he tells everybody that Sarah is his sister, not his wife, because he's afraid that if they think she's his wife, they'll try to steal her from him. So he says, tell everybody you're my sister. So, you know, we revere these men in the Bible as these great, perfect people, but they're not. God, one thing I love about God in this Bible, He does not gloss over anybody's sins in the Bible. He spills the beans on everybody. You see that Abraham, out of fear, tells a lie. Okay? Which one of us has not done that? Okay? So anyway, all of this is familiar territory. We see it happen with Abraham. Now we see it happen with Isaac. Um, in verse 1 of chapter 26, there was a famine in the land, just like beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. Now, I've touched on this, and I don't want to take up too much time reading through all this. Um, so let's get down to uh, where we're going to be in verse 16. Um, in verse 6, Isaac dwelt in Gerar, so he's there, and he does in verse 7 the same thing that Abraham did with Sarah. He tells Rebekah, they should kill me if they think you're my wife. So tell everybody you're my sister. Technically, she was a close kin to Isaac. So may, you could say, well, maybe it wasn't a lie. Eh, it was a lie. And Abimelech called him out on it. And he said, wait a minute, you said this was your sister, not your wife. Why did you do that? If she's your sister, I was going to take her because she wasn't married to you. Now I find out she's married to you. You almost made me a sinner. 
You almost made me kill you. And it was just pure fear. Pure fear. And wrong thinking. How to deal with our fears. Things that we're afraid of. I have not, I've not glossed over. One of my thorns at this time in my life, and I never used to be this way, but anxiety is a big thing with me. And sometimes I am a nervous wreck. And I can't control it. I have no... Sometimes it just happens. And there's no reason for it. Um, things like thing that I mentioned earlier for you to pray for that's a genuine fear um, but I deal with that and how we deal with it is important you know Roy talks about he's open and honest about being an alcoholic but he knows I can't take another drink the rest of my life because it won't be just one drink it'll be a whole bottle and he knows that it'll kill him so just because you have a thorn in your flesh does not mean that you get an automatic excuse from God to do whatever you want and Isaac is his father's son. He does it just the way Abraham did it. And it was wrong. So now, um, Abimelech tells everybody, leave Isaac alone. Don't mess with him. So let's pick it up in verse 12. That's before I have what I have on the screen, but this goes with it. Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. In other words, Isaac now, taking his father's inheritance, God then multiplies that inheritance. If you wonder why certain families are constantly... The Kennedys. How is it the Kennedys, all the Kennedys are filthy rich? How is that? Most of them have not had a job their whole life, and yet they get rolling in money. How is that? Because their great-grandfather, the, I can't remember who was it, Joseph Kennedy, came over to this country, and he somehow worked out a deal where he gets a piece of every bottle of Scotch whiskey that comes over to this country. That's their inheritance. And you know what the Bible says? Woe be to the man who putteth the bottle to his neighbor's lips. And you ask, you know, there's an old saying, how true is that? Does Rose Kennedy have a black dress? How many funerals did she attend? How many sons did she have to bury? How much tragedy has been in that family's life? JFK murdered, RFK murdered, RFK Jr. Plane went down. Nobody knows what happened. Tragic family. But they're all rolling in dough from what their daddy did years ago. Same with Isaac. He now has this great inheritance, but God blesses him, and now it's super great. He had possessions, verse 14, of flocks, possessions of herds, and great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. They were jealous. And it sounds to me like, I want to use this phrase, the poverty pimps in this country who are playing the poor of this nation against the rich of this nation saying that we're poor because you're rich and you must have taken our money. So that's why we're poor and it's not fair. So we want a new government that makes it fair for everybody. That's what Obama told Joe the plumber. I'm going to take your money and I'm going to give it out to whoever I want to and you have got no say about it. That's the same thing going on now. The Philistines envied that. 
You wonder why the world hates us. It's because they are full of rage. Okay, uh, Psalm 2. How does that go? Um, oh, I can't remember. But it's in Psalm 2. You got to look it up. Why doth the heathen rage? Yeah. You know why the heathen rage? Because they're heathen. They're lost. And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. That's a conspiracy against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So this is, this is your LGBTQ RSVP crowd that demands of you your obedience and submission to them. They must have your approval of their life or somehow they feel cheated. You know what? I don't go around asking anybody's permission to be a Christian. I don't need their um, recognition of it. I don't need their advice on it. I'm going to be what God called me to be, and it doesn't matter who doesn't like it. I don't live my life based upon what some people that do not matter to me, what they think about me. And that's, but they're doing it because they want to change everybody's mind. Now, um, look in verse 15, back Genesis 26. For all the wells, watch this now. The Philistines envied Abraham and Isaac. And here's what they did. For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. Why did they do that? Why did they, and what does it matter to you? Why is this story in the Bible? In verse 16, Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. So the Philistines have stolen now all the wells of water that Abraham dug in his lifetime. Would that make you mad? If you, had, if you had a grandpa that was your favorite person in the whole world, and after he died, somebody slipped in and stole his stuff that was precious to you be, to be mementos of his life, and somebody just walked in and stole it right out from underneath it, would that make you mad? That would make me mad. Reg Kelly is also an auctioneer. He does cattle auctions, but he does estate auctions. And he said one of the things that he sees the most of in estate sales is family members fighting over trinkets. No, mama said that I could have that. Mama said that was mine and you can't take it. And he said, I see it all the time. They fight over the stupidest, piddly little things. They'll fight each other in front of lost people. And ruin the gospel. And this is the Philistines. They shut those wells up simply because they didn't own them. So they said, if we can't have them, you can't have them. Then Abimelech kicks him out. In verse 17, Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dig, digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. Now, what makes these Philistines think that that well belongs to them. Who dug it? Abraham did first. And now Isaac is re-digging the well. He's the one pulled all the dirt back out of the well, got the well flowing so he could give water to his family, his servants, and then to his cattle. And the Philistines come and say, that's our well. And they take it from him. And you know what Isaac did about it? He let them do it. Why did he do that? There's an answer. 
Verse 21, they digged another well and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. And he removed from thence and digged another well. And for that, they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth. And he said, for now the Lord hath made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. Now watch this. Here's what I think is going on here. It's obvious to me that God allowed the Philistines to fight over that well and to claim it as theirs, even though it wasn't. Isaac was going to live there by that well. But the Philistines said, that's our, that's our well, that's our water, you can't have it. So Isaac then moves all of his stuff, goes to another well that his dad dug, that the Philistines covered up, and he dug that one. Philistines come back and say, that's our well too, you can't have it. So he goes again, goes to another well. And I, I don't know how many wells he goes through, but finally now, he digs a well that his father Abraham dug, and there, nobody fought for the water. And here's what I think. And you, you know, there's probably 10,000 good interpretations we can get out of a story like this. It is obvious to me that God did not want Isaac at the Valley of Gerar or at um, Esek or at Sitna. God didn't want him there. For some reason, God wanted him in Beersheba because that's where he stayed. We have a New Testament analogy of this. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus, one of the last things he says to all his disciples before he sends up into heaven, he says, uh, and it sh power shall be given to you, and you shall be witnesses of me, both in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and in the uttermost parts of the world. So, you follow the book of Acts, and you find that on the day of Pentecost, they're in Jerusalem, the disciples preach, 3,000 people get saved. And so now, they're gathering together. Well, that lasts a while, but then the Jews have had enough of these followers of Jesus around, and they start persecuting the church. Well, the only thing for them to do was to leave Jerusalem and go to Judea, and they did. And they got there, and they took with them the gospel, and they preached the gospel there in Judea, in all the parts of Judea. And they're building local churches, gathering places. People are being saved. People are being baptized. Churches are being raised up. And all of a sudden now, the Jews again are going, you're still here. So they persecuted them, killed some of them, and God let it happen. But it fulfilled what God said. You're going to preach the gospel in Judea. And to, to be honest, human nature being what it is, when we get comfortable, do we like to get up from it? No. Once I lay down and make my nest at night, and I get good and comfy, I don't want to get up for anything. That's us. God had a better plan. It cost them. People's lives were being destroyed. But the gospel was preached into Judea now. Then after that, they go into Samaria, which is the capital of the ten northern tribes. And what do they do? They're preaching the gospel, and they're building churches, and people are getting saved. And they get persecuted there, so they scatter. And they're still scattering. The gospel is still moving around this world. And any time... When we don't do sometimes what God wants us to do, or we need a little motivation to do what's right, believe me, God will allow Satan to jab at you 
to stir you up, to get you motivated. I've told this story before, but it happens, it's happened so many times. The first time I really, really felt it and understood it. It's not too long after I became pastor here. And I wanted to please God. I really did. There was, I mean, just an overwhelming spirit that was just driving me crazy. And I was very unhappy. And I didn't know what was going on, but all I wanted to do was leave everything. And finally, I'm back there behind the baptistry, and I'm just crying, bawling my eyes out. God, I don't know what to do. And the Holy Ghost said, smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. When that hit me, do you know what emotion came to me? Anger. I got mad at the devil. And I stood up. I physically stood up. And I said, you're not getting them today. Today is not your day. God gave them to me. That day down in the woods, the day before we buried our granddaughter, same thing. You can't have them. God gave them to me. And I think I'm going to hang on to them. God let those things happen to motivate me, to stir me up so that I serve God better than I did the day before. I promise you, you read 1 Peter and then tell me that God doesn't use persecution to make us better. I'm telling you, He does. Now, let's look at this well just for a few minutes. What does that well represent? Well, again... People would read a story like this, and they might ask, why is this even in the Bible? I used to do that. I'd say, why do I need to know this? It's already happened, so what's up? I was just so ignorant then. And then God opened my eyes to the typology, the symbolism, the things. that Pay attention to that, because that's going to happen in your life, and that's going to happen in the future. So start paying attention to these stories instead of skipping over them, because you think they're not interesting. And then God changed my heart. So there may be 10,000 sermons I could preach out of Genesis 26 in a lifetime. But this well of water. What one story comes to your mind would I mention a well of water? The woman at the well. And by the way, she's not the only story of a woman at a well. Hagar was kicked out. By Abraham and Sarah. She took Ishmael, her son, and she, was, she knew they were going to die. She set Ishmael down. She walked away far enough to way where she could not hear him screaming for his life. And sat down to die. And God saw her, and the angel of the Lord, who I believe was Jesus, appeared unto her. And God opened her eyes, and lo and behold, she's sitting right in front of a well but never saw it. Have you ever had that happen to you? Where God put something right in front of you and you didn't even recognize it until God opened your eyes one day. Man, that's, that, I love that. Proverbs 5.15, drink, watch this now. Drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. There's a lot of applications to this. Number one, family. Family. My family is one of the most important things to me. God has just put it, he's, uh, it was in my mom and dad. It was in their mom and dad. It's just been in us. And I know not every family is like that. Fam some families get busted up and I understand that. I'm not trying to boast on anything. This is the grace of God. But God made family important to me, important enough 
to fight their biggest enemy, which was me. Every thing that God changed in me, in some way he used my family to motivate me. Because he knew that's where my heart was. Now you take that now and think about it. Drink waters out of thine own cistern. And running waters out of thine own well. What is it that you can get from somebody else that you cannot get from your own family? Okay? Here's another application. Drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. Read your Bible yourself. Read your Bible yourself. I've said that twice today. I don't know why, but I've said it twice today. I cannot be responsible for withholding anything from you. I'm trying to, the best I can, preach the whole counsel of God each and every week. Sometimes I fail. Sometimes I do it well. But ultimately, the things that you need from God may not always come out of my mouth. They will come to you directly from the Holy Ghost through the Word of God. That's your well. That's your well. Your church. Your church. And I'll just say this. I mentioned earlier. I, I, I'm a jealous, godly, jealous pastor. I had a guy that used to call me. He was an older man. He was retired. And, well, sometimes I just, I don't know if I did it the right way. But this guy made it a habit of calling me here. And when he would get me on the phone, he would ask me some question about something I said in a message. And then he would start arguing with me about it. And then he would start saying what other preachers he heard on the internet say. And I finally, after about three or four times, Roy, of letting this guy dump all this on me every time, and he called for no other reason but to start a fight and tell me that what I said, other preachers that he listens to, they said something different. So what makes you right? And finally, I had enough of it. And I said, sir, I'm going to give you some advice. You say that you listen to all these pastors. I'm going to advise you to pick one. Pick one. Whose faith follow considering uh, their conversation. In other words, the Bible is telling us if your pastor is in the Word of God, you follow that man. If you know he's in the Word of God, he's not without error, he's not without mistakes, but you follow his faith. And I told this man gently, I said, I think you need to pick one. It doesn't have to be me, but you need to settle on one pastor and follow that man. I said, but what you're doing is you're trying to compare me with other preachers that you've listened to. And Paul said, comparing ourselves among ourselves, we're not wise. My ministry is different than any other guy's. So, politely and respectfully, I'm going to ask you to pick a pastor. And if it's not me, follow that guy and stop calling me trying to start a fight. And then he really got under my skin. You know what your problem is? you got a bad temper. That's your problem. You... And I just... Okay, sir, God bless you, but I'm going to hang up now. And he was still talking when I clicked the phone down. He hadn't called back. I've, I've seen it. I've seen people do it over the years. I saw it in a couple that God sent our way. I went to their house, I witnessed to them, I gave them the gospel, they both bowed, husband and wife, gave their life to the Lord there in their living room, said, thank you pastor for coming by, let's talk about baptism, a couple weeks later, on a Sunday night, they were going to be baptized, and they brought 
her sister and her brother-in-law to the baptism. Well, they went to one of these charismatic churches up in the city. And there was just something about them I didn't trust. Sure enough, lo and behold, those people were telling this young, new, birth Christian couple that I was preaching the false gospel, they need to get in that charismatic church, and in two weeks after they were baptized here, they were gone, and I've not seen them since. They never came back. So I know what happens. I know what happens. I know, I know from experience, and I know from people telling me that there's been people sit in this church for years and despise me. And I'm going, I don't want that. If you're not happy, go somewhere else. But don't play me against, especially one of my friends. And this guy, he would say, well, I listened to Reg Kelly and he said, don't do that. Reg, I met with him Tuesday. He invited me down graciously to preach on the Bible issue for his camp meeting down there. He called me the other, he called me yesterday to ask how I was doing because he cared about me that's my friend don't try to put me against my friend I don't believe in that other pastors and I know listen drink waters out of thine own cistern amen uh, song of Solomon 4 thy lips O my spouse there's always an interchange in the song of Solomon it's a love story and the story is Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, um, she's black. So in Ethiopia, Sheba right now, they're Ethiopian black Jews. And in the 90s, Israel flew a bunch of them in and they became citizens of Israel. Thy lips, this is the woman speaking. Thy lips, O my spouse, drop as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under thy tongue. And the smell of thy garments is like the smell of... Net. No, it's, it's, I think it's Christ saying it to his bride. The smell of Lebanon. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. Yes, this is Christ speaking to his church. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. A spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Thy plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits. Camphir and spikenard and spikenard and saffron and calamus and cinnamon... Smell it with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all the chief spices. Watch this. A fountain of gardens, a well of living waters and streams from Lebanon. He's talking about the church. We're here to give people what Christ has given us. Let's be a well of living waters waters amen john 4 12 here's the story of the woman at the well if they're greater than our father jacob which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle you see again we're going to see it with jacob jacob's well jesus answered and said unto her whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again but whosoever drinketh of the water that i shall give him shall never thirst but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And you know what? When I found that well, this word is true. I'm not going to any other well. Now think of what we just read. Isaac tried it here. The Philistines pushed him out. Isaac dug here. Philistines pushed him out. Isaac dug there. Philistines pushed him out. The one place where we know for a fact God wanted him is the well that he dug up and he didn't have to fight over it. God was going to let him keep that one. That one was obviously the one that God wanted him to have. So you make an application in your life. 
What is God moving in you? What is He doing to you? What, where, which way is He turning you? Are you in a situation where you are being persecuted? Are you in a situation where you are aggrieved? Are you in a situation where you're crying out? Are you in a situation where you're in sin? Are you in a situation where you're just, there's no happiness? God's got the well for you. He's got the well for you. It may take a little while for you to get there, but when you get there, I promise you, you'll never go to another one. I'm not changing religions. And I'm not changing Bibles. And I'm not switching churches. Although I did tell Reg that if he died, I'm going to go down there and take over his church. He thought it was funny too, so... Do what? No, <laughs> I'm not. Listen, this is home. And uh, this is where I want to end my life, all right? Let's pray. Father, I love you. I thank you, God, for good words. Lord, help, help somebody tonight. Find the well that they've been looking for. Help them find that living water. Lest they die. And Father, if it's worth keeping, we'll fight for it. Or rather, God, if it's worth keeping, we'll ask you to just give it to us. And I believe you will. So Father, lead each person listening to me tonight. Maybe one thing I said would be a blessing to them. And that would bless me, God. So I pray, Father, Lord, that you would open our eyes oftentimes to the things right in front of us, things we don't see. And teach us the value of one well, one cistern, one fellowship, one Bible, one church. Teach us the value of that. Give us grace and humble us, Father. Use us for your kingdom this week. We thank you for your word. We love you in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming this afternoon.